Today we're going to talk about waves. I think I'm going to do this in two different videos. The first video is going to cover definitional terms. We'll be able to put some of the basic mathematical descriptions behind waves. And in a second video, I'm going to talk a lot about superposition and standing waves. Very interesting stuff, but that'll take a, a little bit of time in and of itself. In general, a wave is something that transports energy that's very fundamental, very important. In fact, some of the most important ways of transferring energy come from waves. There are a lot of different types. Specifically, we have electromagnetic waves, which include things like radio waves and gamma rays, visible light, uh, microwaves, all kinds of different things. And then we also have another classification that I'm going to really focus on in this particular video called a mechanical wave. A mechanical wave actually needs uh, material to travel through. So there have to be particles available that can move back and forth in some way so that the wave can transport that energy. Uh, almost like a game of tag from one particle to the next particle, transfer information and energy. Just to keep things standardized in this video, I'm going to always have my energy for the wave being transferred in the horizontal direction. That way you don't ever have to question what way I'm trying to demonstrate that. Within mechanical waves, so the things that actually need a medium to transport energy, we have different types of classifications. The first is a transverse wave, and so this will be much easier to visualize here in a little bit when I show some pictures. But a transverse wave is going to have particle motion that travels in the vertical, even though the wave itself is transporting energy in the horizontal. There's a different type of wave that is a longitudinal wave. Sometimes it's called a compression wave. In fact, that's one of my preferred ways to refer to it, where the particle motion is in the same direction as the energy transfer. A third classification is a surface wave. It's neither in the vertical or horizontal. It's a combination of all of these things. It's a circular pattern that the particles will make as the wave tra travels by. Your best example of a surface wave is going to be an ocean wave or something in the water. To help us visualize these different types of waves, I'm going to use uh, yet again FET simulations. So these are the simulations that are free for people to use out of the University of Colorado. They're great. The ones in particular that I'm going to use today are the wave on a string simulations and the wave interface simulations. This is a FET simulation called wave on a string that will help us visualize our transverse waves. Remember the identifying thing of a transverse wave is that the particle motion is perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. And if you look at this simulation, we are showing that the wave is traveling from left to right. That is the direction of energy transfer. And focus in on just one of these little particles, and perhaps you're looking at the green one, you'll notice its motion is entirely characterized in the vertical direction. And we'll be coming back to this. In this FET simulation called wave interference, you can see an approximation of a longitudinal wave. Remember the characteristic of a longitudinal wave is that the particle motion moves in the same direction as the energy is being transferred. Perhaps focus in on this guy right here. You can see it's just going back and forth, back and forth, even though the energy of the wave is being transferred in the more or less horizontal direction, at least if you're down here at the axis. It's going up a little bit if you're looking above the axis there. Let us move on to some definitions. To begin with, I'm going to put up a generic picture of a wave. You can actually visualize this easily as a transverse wave, but we could also use this imagery for a longitudinal wave where the high points of this represent perhaps the higher pressure regions of the sound wave that you just saw. Our first term is going to be the principal axis. It is the center line for the wave. It's going to act upon the principal axis. It should be symmetrical right in the middle of this thing. The high points of the wave we will call a crest. Uh, so there are multiple crests. 
and the low points are going to be troughs. The separation of the wave, so how wide and drawn out it is, we refer to as the wavelength. It's easiest to identify the actual wavelength if you look from a crest to a crest, and so I'm identifying that from here to here. The wavelength is a characteristic of the wave, and so it also would be the same number if you were looking at from, say, a trough to a trough. Let's clear this off for a moment and put up some new terms. The height of the wave is called the amplitude. The amplitude is going to be measured from the highest point, so I'm looking at the crest here, down to the principal axis. The importance of the amplitude for a mechanical wave is that it is the measure of energy. And in fact, we can say that the energy is proportional to the amplitude squared. So let me say that in a different way. Let's say you're standing in the ocean and a wave comes by that is one meter tall. It has an amplitude of one meter. It has some amount of energy associated with it. If a second wave comes by later in the day that is twice the amplitude, it has, say, two meters of amplitude, it will actually carry not twice as much energy, but two squared, or four times as much energy. Three meter tall wave would carry nine times the energy because it would be a three squared. These three X's that I've put up are supposed to be in symmetrically similar locations about this wave. We would say that they are in phase with each other. There's nothing special about those locations in particular. I could look at different locations, these blue circles. Those are also in phase with one another. Anything that is not in phase is out of phase. So the only locations for, that are in phase for those blue circles are the ones I've identified. Everything else is out of phase. Now we come back to the FET simulation to identify those same terms on this actual wave that's moving by. You'll notice we see the principal axis here. This is a transverse wave because the particle motion is going up and down. You can see the amplitude of the wave here is the height from the principal axis up to the crest. I will go over here and I will adjust the amplitude. You should see that I have now changed the height. Notice the new part of the wave is coming in with this greater magnitude here. You can identify the wavelength by looking at one crest relative to an adjacent crest. So the distance is something that we would actually measure in some units of length, perhaps meters. The distance is what we refer to as the wavelength here. Now we're going to come in and we're going to put a little bit of mathematics onto this wave discussion. We're going to use a very straightforward algebraic equation that says V is equal to F times lambda. So that thing on the end there is the Greek letter lambda. It's kind of an upside down Y. The V stands for velocity. We would have pretty standard units for that, something like meters per second. Lambda is the wavelength, and so it is a length measurement meters in this case. And then frequency is something that we can measure in inverse seconds. That is 1 over seconds. But we have a different name that we tag to it very frequently, which is hertz. So you'll hear me say that a lot. Physically, the frequency of something is the number of cycles or the number of repetitions that you see in this wave per time. And so if I'm using an example here of I'm standing in the ocean and I see five crests come by. I should say, actually more specifically, not necessarily just five crests, but five full and complete cycles. So I see five cycles come by in 25 seconds. Then I can just do some quick division and I can find that the frequency of that particular wave would be 0 0.2 inverse seconds, which I would also say is 0 0.2 hertz. All right, moving back to this equation, now that we know what everything stands for, we need to talk about some important properties of waves. First, the velocity of a wave is determined by the medium that it's traveling through. You've heard people talk about the speed of sound. It's a constant number depending on the medium. So if you have a particular pressure, you're traveling through air and it's a particular temperature, 
the speed of sound will always be the same, no matter what, say, the frequency or the wavelength of that sound is. The frequency of a wave, any wave, is decided by the source itself. So if we go back to our sound analogy, my voice box is deciding the frequency that I speak at. I can change that and speak lower or I can speak higher. That is decided by the source. Lambda is going to be the thing that you actually use this math equation for. So we would say it is the dependent variable. It depends on whatever the other two parameters were so that this math equation can actually hold true. So I've labeled it as the dependent variable there. In a sense, these are the independent variables for this particular equation. However, I have identified that velocity determined by the medium, frequency determined by the source. That's why you will sometimes see the same equation written like this. This is more standard mathematically to have our dependent variable written on the left and our independent variables on the right. Okay, so this is going to finish up a lot of the terminology that I wanted to talk about, the basic terminology at least. Reminders of things. Energy is transferred via waves. And in my little demonstration here, I was showing that waves are always traveling in the horizontal. That was just for my slides. But you could see how we classify different waves. So we talked about different definitions. We talked about crests and troughs, where the principal axis is. What is a longitudinal wave versus a transverse wave? Hopefully you're picking up some of that terminology. We also identified that straightforward equation that I put up there. And I can't stress this enough. The velocity of a wave is determined by the medium. The frequency of a wave is determined by the source. And the wavelength will be whatever it needs to be in order for that relationship, that mathematical relationship, to hold true. That's all I wanted to cover for the first part of this video. And then we're going to get into the really interesting stuff about waves in the second video, where I'll talk about superposition and uh, standing waves. For now, though, if you think you understood everything that we talked about, let your computer know.